Chasing Peaks team looked a little different this trip. Simon and his cousin Mike had submitted for the ballot and scored a first period shot in the block Wapiti River. Now Mike is no stranger to Fiordland. These two have probably walked more miles in these hills than I've walked in all of my hunting trips put together. So I had to really up my game to stay in the mix here. No pressure. We took our time heading down to Fiordland, stopping in at the beautiful Lake Tekapo for a night, giving us a chance to go over all of our gear for the next 10 days and break the trip up from Nelson. Queenstown was our next destination, getting all of our food and a few more essentials so we could then cruise down to Tiana for the briefing. I couldn't deny I was nervous for the days ahead. The only thing I had to go off was the stories of those who had hunted these hills before me. And some of the phrases that came to mind were torrential rain, wet to the bone, some of the worst weather that I've been in, but to my surprise, we had an almost perfect weather forecast and the benefit of being some of the first hunters to get into these blocks after the COVID-19 lockdown cut last year's ballot short. All the odds seemed stacked in our favour. What an opportunity. So we've uh, finally reached land <laughs> and we're in one piece. It was a pretty dusty trip over. Uh, yeah, no, a bit rough actually, bit of wind about. Our boat trip over Tiana was a great reminder of how quickly a lake can turn ugly. A strong southerly was ripping through and it certainly slowed us down, but we got there eventually. We hit the hay hoping the next day was a bit more forgiving wind-wise. Simon's master plan involved three blokes and packs into an inflatable to cross Lake Hankinson. Little by little we crawled across the lake, and just to add insult to injury, the other party blazed over us in their chopper. We jokingly ripped the finger knowing they would get deep into the block in just a fraction of the time. Hopefully by our next trip we've got the gorse out of our pockets. It'll go bro. So go. <laughs> this old thing. This is what you catch fish with when you've got no rod, but you've got a reel. So you just zip tie the old reel on there. <laughs> Not much play in it. Yeah, you can... No flex. <laughs> but it's, you don't need it because you just pull the fish out like that anyway. <laughs> Now our mate Simon is quite the outdoorsman. He spent years honing his craft and over this time has put blood, sweat and tears into perfecting his roar. Get ready folks, you're about to see a master at work. Oh, 
Can this be for you? All jokes aside, he let out a few good bellows while we had a break and must have done something right as we had a visitor pretty soon after. After that close encounter we got the hitch. As we worked into Lake Sutherland, roars were coming in thick and fast and we started adopting more desperate measures in order to entice the stags to come our way. Lake Sutherland was home to a good population of animals, and overnight they made sure we knew they were there. Simon and Mike went out on a brief morning stalk to see if any of those roars originated from a big bugger. Although hard to see, that bull had future potential, but certainly wasn't old enough to take. From here, we started our trek to the tops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't stuff. I mean, this is near fing beautiful shit. <sighs> Just a what a casual five hours to gain 500 meters elevation. Chill on the end, broken us yet, but getting close. Love one, bro. Thank you. So after a pretty nasty slog up through that um, bit of a push, yeah, bit of a push, we're, um, we're into the easier stuff now. Planning on walking up on the tops here now, ending up just down below 1300 metres above sea level there and camping up for the night and then perhaps moving in and out of there. Hmm. Right. I suppose we should rip into it then, eh? Uh, sense of achievement. It's worth it.
So currently what we're dealing with is this is our glassing grounds. Unfortunately, we were greeted with less than ideal glassing conditions. Eventually the clag did clear and we had a good stint glassing Massacre Gully. To absolutely no avail though. Rules were intermittently ringing out through the morning, but all originating from Lake Sutherland. So we carried on up, headed for our campsite right to the top of the bridge, separating Massacre Gully and Rum Gully, to see what that would offer. Even from 1300 metres away, we could tell this animal was a mature bull based on a few variables. His head was held low, his movements were a bit more laboured compared to that of a younger bull, even though his antlers weren't overly tall, they had good mass, and also his neck was sagging below his chest line. Although not a really tall symmetrical antler layout, this is certainly the type of bull that we would be taking, as he looked 8 plus years old, and had he been more accessible, he would have been in trouble. Since we were pretty early in our trip and still had plenty of country to hunt, we decided we wouldn't pursue him. We set up in this awesome little spot sheltered from the wind, with great visibility of Rum Gully and Massacre Gully. As the evening started setting in, Simon and I pushed down to get a better look over the Rum Gully flats, spotting another young bull with great future potential. Although the general consensus of Fiordland was that it more often than not served up some pretty miserable weather, people frequently talk about how insanely beautiful the country is, and I couldn't agree more. So last night we were posed with a couple of options in regards to the direction of our hunt from here on out. Um, seeing a lot of activity down in Rum Gully, where we were glassing last night. Um, saw a relatively decent bull, quite young, bugling away, trying to round up a few um, cows and that. But um, on further inspection this morning, the boys went down there, had another look, and found there was more than likely a bigger bull hanging around in the scrub. We were then looking at the option of possibly going down that Rum Gully area, but it's all quite, it's pretty steep faces and that sort of thing, and we found it was probably not the safest option, so we've decided to shoot back around and go down Massacre, Massacre Gully there. Head down to Sutherland Lake again, possibly spend a night there, and then from there, shoot our way back up Rum Gully and just hunt from the flats, which just kind of puts us at a slight disadvantage in regards to getting on top of the animals, but um, it's kind of our only option as far as safety goes, but clouds as you can probably see is rolling in pretty hard and pretty fast so getting off the tops is our best bet at this stage because we I mean like as I speak the, the view is just going but yeah we'll pack up camp now and then uh, start tracing down the hill bloody good as we started our walk down we spotted something that isn't so common in this neck of the woods chamois and given the curiosity of this herd seeing humans wasn't so common either we sat down and watched them for a while a great time waster.
always push them down into that scrub. Every hunt has its fair share of lessons, and on this hunt particularly, I learnt a big one. Being 75 kilos dripping wet, my biggest weakness is usually a heavy pack, and at this point I was fatigued, not just physically, but mentally. While scaling down the hill, I decided to take my pack off for just a moment, and I lost control of it. And, well, you'll see. I was bloody lucky here. The bushbuck destroyer pack held up really well. No damage whatsoever. The things inside it however, not so much. The camera had a couple of really decent cracks in the front of it, and the lens attached to the camera had snapped some of the internals. But to my surprise, the camera still worked. Just enough so to last out the rest of the trip. After rolling end over end and dropping off a 5 metre bluff, we were only one lens down. Thank God for that. When on the tops looking over this catchment, we saw what looked like a dead whoppity deer, so we wanted to take a better look at it. This animal had clearly taken a similar path to my pack and ended up pretty banged up at the bottom of those rocky bluffs. It was a few days old, so we didn't look too far into its cause of death. Had he been shot, or did he lose a fight against a rival and took the short way down the hill? Who knows? What we couldn't work out was that one of his ears was cut off clean. We found it hard to believe that any natural cause could have done this, so we were left wondering. Let us know in the comments if you've encountered this before, or know why its ear was like that. We'd be pretty curious to know. After a huge nudge, we were more than excited to get to camp and have a debrief. We stalked our way down the hill and eventually got to the head of Lake Sutherland. Tomorrow, we decided to take it easy and try to get some eyes on these buglers we kept hearing from the tops. We woke up to another day of primo fueled and weather, spending the morning scoping the life around Sutherland. Plenty of animals came to the party too. What a spot. That's him. Yep. As you can probably tell by the uh, debris, I've been up to a whole lot of all today. Food's about half the weight it was <laughs> this morning. A little bit of excitement filled the day. We heard some bashing up behind the camp, thinking it was an unknowing whoppity stag, we were ready to go. But we pretty quickly realised it was the other party lugging through the fruits of their labour. We quickly put the spotting scope on them to try and find out what they had taken. Seeing a rack of whoppity points got us excited to go find our own set. After seeing the boys had vacated the upper Wapiti River catchment, we decided to go have a look for ourselves, considering there were still plenty of bugles coming from that area of the block. We stumbled across plenty of sign, but at first, no evidence of a mature animal holding cows, only young sprogs on the valley floor.
It wasn't until we got further up the valley that we heard a bit of commotion up ahead. We started to pursue, roaring back and forth. This bull was responding well for a star, but he got further and further away, and we only managed to get a glimpse at one of his entourage. We started losing light, so we cut our losses and headed back to camp, so we could glass the edges of Sutherland for the evening. Unfortunately, no mature bulls showed themselves, but it was certainly entertaining watching the young bucks confidently roam the lake edge. As the evening drew closer, we kept a low profile, cooked up a trusty back country, and settled in for the evening. So far the experience of Fieldland's weather has been it's been quite hard really to deal with. You've been really doing it doing it rough, eh? The end of our trip was drawing closer, and the fact we hadn't yet secured a trophy animal was certainly in the back of our minds. Every animal we saw, apart from the mature bull that was out of our reach, wasn't mature enough to shoot. Although frustrating, we still have respect for the cause and would rather go home empty-handed than take a bull that could become much more than it was in the form that we saw it. The Fiordland experience is an exceptional one, with or without antlers strapped to our packs. We still had time, and Rum Gully had definitely been a hive of activity from what we had seen so far. Plenty of young bulls, and plenty of hinds. We hoped the competition in this catchment held the bull we were looking for. As we arrived, on the early evening, the deer were out in force, with one amazing whoppity with incredible antler structure. This will be the bull of a lifetime one day. Fuelland finally showed its true colours, and the weather started to set in. Simon braved the elements and went for probably our last attempt at finding a trophy bull, stalking into the head basin of Rum Gully. Mike and I held down the fort at camp and kept an eye on the clearing if anything got pushed down from Simon. This is 
more like the fuel than that I was expecting. Windy and cold. Nearly raining. Same for us. The day drew on and counting mosquitoes got a little bit tedious. So we sat outside and watched the free to view nature show right on our doorstep. Another stag and a very young whoppity bull we nicknamed Albie because of its stark white coat made themselves at home and gave us a good source of entertainment for the dreary day. Albie was quite a confident young fella and eventually got so close he caught wind of us and slowly worked his way into the bush. Without even knowing, Simon was also trying to get as close as possible to the other stag and he too eventually made his way into the scrub. Unfortunately, Simon came back empty handed and that left us tomorrow and the following day to find our way back home. Simon once told me a story of the infamous Fiordland trout, how there were so many of them you'd see their dorsal fins poking out of the water sometimes. I was itching to get amongst it and hopefully catch us a feed as we had the perfect pairing cooling down in the river. These old kids have been fiending for a fish. But well, here we go, finally. Dearman's opportunity. Let's see if he can actually catch anything. To my surprise, we didn't hook up first cast. Simon must have been pulling my leg. Oh man, they're not that hard to catch. <laughs> I wonder if it's even might pay to go into that deep dark spot. Better yeah. right. It was an absolute rush catching my first ever trout that wasn't considered a mature white bait. We thought that surely we had plenty more to catch after our quick success, but we wandered the river for hours until we got lucky just on dusk. Lake Hankinson, eh? Beautiful brown. Is that dinner, is it? I think that is dinner. Yeah. Cheers, buddy. Thanks, mate. Good fishing, kids. <laughs> Outdoors. With kids. 
What happens when you catch the trout right on dusk, eh? As it always does, we felt that we blinked and were back in the boat to head home. Certainly a perspective shifting experience for myself, and a great opportunity for the old boys to see if their knees could still handle the fierce field and terrain. Our final hunting mission of the trip was to stalk in on a highly anticipated Ferg Burger, an essential last stop in the deep south. Another great memory added to the bank. Thanks for watching guys, we'll see you on the next hunt.